Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Today, my friends, uh, I've had someone send me a um, article that they wanted me to discuss and give the pros and cons on. And uh, the article is called The Top 10 Reasons Why Too Many People Retire Poor. Uh, it's written by Stephen Adcock, Adcock, I guess the author's name, and it was done in August of 2019. Uh, and it's in a, some type of a, oh, I guess it's called Ladders is the name of the company to put the article out. I don't even know what Ladders is and didn't even take the time to bother to, to figure it out. Uh, but it is an interesting article, and most times when I review articles, I end up not agreeing with most of what they say, if not all, but most of what. And in this particular article, I think it's pretty much right on. It hits it nail right on the head here. And so I think it's a good one to go through, and I think we'll take some time here and do it. It starts out by saying that uh, back in 1956, Earl Nightingale tracked the fortune of 100 individuals at starting from the age of 25, and he followed them all the way to age 65, which would have been the age of retirement. And what he found was is that um, by by the time they were 65, only one of them was rich. Four of them were financially independent. Five were still working, and 54 percent were broke. So um, you know what it comes down to uh, is that. Ninety-five percent of people are going to retire either poor or broke, whereas five percent of the people are going to retire well off or rich. And you look at these numbers across the board, and they probably play out pretty well, pretty accurately across the board on this. Uh, but they've got ten reasons why they think this occurs, and I actually think their ten reasons make a lot of sense. So we're going to go ahead and cover them. The first one, number one is they never clearly defined financial freedom. And uh, I think the problem is not that they don't clearly define it, although there's no argument with that statement. They're not clearly defined. I think the problem is what people believe to be financial freedom. And I'm going to give you my explanation is being two things. One, what people believe financial freedom is, is what we call stacks and stacks of money. You know, you always hear the uh, all the rappers and the gangsters talk about it got stacks. And it's not so far from being the truth of what the average person thinks. They think they save up enough money, you get a pile of money, and then you can retire off of it and live off of it until you die. So the idea is if you pile your pile high enough, uh, it can support you until you die. Challenges to that theory, starting off with, is that sometimes you can't get that pile that high. Sometimes you live longer than the pile. So the goal with that type of a theory, if you invert the theory, the goal of the theory is die before you run out of money. Now, think about that as a way to live your life. Do you really want to live your life under the pretenses that, you know, I got I to gotta get dead. I got to get dead soon because I'm running out of money. It doesn't seem right, does it? Um So how do you oppose that? What's the opposing theory to that? Well, the opposing theory is the one I believe to be true, which is financial freedom equals the day that your passive income equal or exceeds your cost of living. So if you get up and go to work every day, your goal is to make enough money to live up to your standard of living. But what really happens is that your standard of living lives down to what you earn. And now some people... If you think about the way it's supposed to happen in uh, the book Think and Grow Rich, uh, you hear the term, I'm sorry, in Richest Man in Babylon, you hear the term, pay yourself first. What does that mean? Well, if you made 
$1,000 this week. You're supposed to take 10 of it or 100 of it, 10%, and put it in the bank of savings. Now go learn to live on $900. And the basic theory behind that is pretty sound. It's pretty solid because the truth is you could get paid $900. If tomorrow your boss cut your pay to $900, you'd learn to live on $900, right? Um, but if your boss doesn't cut your Caught, or caught your income down to 900 why aren't you just living on 900 anyway and saving 100 and the concept is pay yourself first take that 100 out and then put the 900 in your checking account and that's all you have you just sort of trick yourself it's just make it invisible i've done this my entire life the difference was gosh and i hate to tell people this i lived on like 50 percent of my money i never lived on more than 50 percent of my money in fact as you get wealthier and wealthier, you live on a smaller and smaller percentage of it. That's why rich people get exponentially rich. They get rich faster and faster and faster because they're making so much money, right? So you, if you can go create enough passive income to cover all your expenses, you're literally retired in my book. I did that at age, I started at 27, no, really, I started at 29, retired 32, uh, two and a half years after I started, something like that, I was able to replace my earned income with passive income. Now, that wasn't that hard to do when you really think about it, because what I was earning was, I think, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. And so my take-home pay was probably something like $4,000 a month, three or $4,000 a month. I said, well, what do you mean? If you're making sixty grand a year, aren't you making you know, 5000 a month? And the answer is no. You're making 5000 a month, but by the time they take taxes and insurance and 401k and I, you know ins- everything out, your take-home pay, because you've got to pay Social Security and Medicare, you've got to pay income taxes, right? And then the, sometimes they take 401k out, sometimes they take insurance out. Bottom line is you take home about 3000 bucks out of $5,000 paycheck, and that's all you're really living on. And you've got to get that through your head uh, to be able to become rich. You say, well... Pfft, that doesn't. I, the problem is I need to make more money. Yes, the problem is you need to make more money. To get rich, you need to make more money. You can't save your way to massive wealth. But the first step is to realize what wealth is and what freedom is, financial freedom, which is to go ahead and replace your earned income. Once you've replaced your earned income, you've now got all kinds of choices, right? Now, if I have enough passive income to, to cover my expenses... Then why get up and go to work? Well, I got up and went to work because every penny I earned meant that I could put much, much more money in my savings account. And I could save towards becoming wealthy, right? That becomes the end-all, be-all to everything, right? As far as money goes, now I'm not talking about life in general. There's more to life than money. But in general, for money, the goal is to get there. So what happens is, is once you have passive income to replace your earned income, You could just go and start living your life as a retired person. That doesn't happen very often. What normally happens is people that figured out how to replace their passive income go, man, if I can replace my passive income, why don't I just add more of it, right? If I can get up to $5,000 a month, in fact, if I was earning $5,000, I only needed $3,000 to replace my income. If I can get up to $3,000, why not bring it up to $6,000? And now I actually double the standard of my living. And then if I don't increase the standard of my living, now I'm saving twice as fast. And you get the picture here within no time at all. You're compounding your wealth and you're becoming very, very wealthy. But it all starts with the picture. It all starts with clarity. What does financial freedom really mean? It means you have income that you are earning passively. That's what financial freedom means. That's what retirement is. Retirement is not an age. People believe it's an age. It's not an age. I have people in our group that retire in their 20s all the time. I retired in my 30s. I was a little slower because I I didn't have a mentor to help me. But it's not an age, right? And it's not an amount of money. It's an amount of income which is a completely different point of view. So if you can get that, you're well on your way to the biggest and most important first step towards accomplishing financial freedom. It's just understanding what it means. And for you, you need to go and figure it out. Bring your, Get your paycheck out with your spouse. Something you never do, which is to talk about money with your spouse. Get your paycheck out and look at the deductions and look at what you actually take home. 
That is what you need to replace with passive income. Now we'll talk about on the next step is, okay, how much money do we have to invest to try to get there? Where can we get more money to try to invest to get there? Uh, how can we get better returns on what we invest to get there, et cetera, et cetera? The rest all falls into place. But first of all, you have to understand what it is you're really trying to do. We'll take a short break. Be right back with the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time. Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today we're discussing an article um, that's put out by something called Ladders, which I don't have any idea it is, but it says, Why do people retire poor? And it's talking about 10 reasons why they believe that is. So the second reason we're on to now is uh, they say they never make financial freedom an absolute must. And they say people basically are lazy and, you know, they'd love to be rich if they could win the lottery or if they could marry somebody that's rich or they could inherit a fortune. Uh, But to actually get out there and do something about it is just something they're not willing to do. Well, there's probably a lot of truth to that. Um, I have children and, uh, they don't seem to be really all about getting rich. And, you know, I don't have any friends that aren't rich, really, because it just sort of attract, you know, you're attracted to people that think like you do and care about things that you care about. So, you know, the people that don't care about have really no interest in becoming wealthy at all, for whatever reason that is, but they're saying it's mostly laziness. Let me change this and talk about the people who do for a second. I remember when I was a young kid, I wanted to retire by 30 years of age. And I had a guy that was a boss. Didn't really like the guy. Kind of was impressed by the guy. Um, but I thought he was kind of an arrogant, you know what, SOB. And, uh, but his theory was that he was going to work twice as hard, twice as many hours a week as anybody else, and double the amount of money he made by working twice as hard and twice as many hours. So I ended up working for him. So his theory was we work 12 hours a day, six days a week. And whatever that comes out to be, you know, 68 hours or whatever I think it is, that was the idea. And because of that, you'd make a lot more money than you would normally make. And... His theory was, you know, you make twice as much as everybody else. You save half of it or better. And especially if you're working 12 hours a day, six days a week, you really don't have any time to spend it. Take my word for it. You know, there was barely enough time to get up, get a workout in, and go to work, work all day and all night, come home, get something to eat, go to sleep, boom, do it all over again. But I lost all the money in the stock market. Um, not all of it, but most of it in the stock market crash in 1987. And I woke back up the next day and thought, man, I worked for 12 years, 68 hours a week to get what? To get a pile of money. And the pile of money was taken away from me overnight. And that's when you realize a pile of money doesn't really do you much good. It's not the pile. That's not the goal. And so I went looking for other ways because I said, you know, I can't work 12 hours a day, six days a week to catch back. I can't go back and redo 12 years of my life to get caught right back up to where I was at. That just wasn't acceptable. So now I had the goal of making money quickly. Now, here's an interesting point. Tony Robbins has a statement. He says, be careful for what you ask for because you'll get it. And so his example is someone that's way overweight, and he says, okay, look, I'm fat, and I don't want to be fat, so what I want to do is lose weight. So there's the question, how do I lose weight? And the answer comes back to your brain. Your brain is infinitely, has infinite wisdom and says to you, look, fat, so you lose weight by stop eating and start exercising. And you go, hmm. I don't even like that answer. Although the answer may be true, I don't like that answer. And so you take no action on it. 
He said what you should have done was ask the correct question. The correct question was, how can I lose weight quickly? Or how can I lose weight quickly and keep it off? Or a better question is, how can I lose weight quickly, keep it off, and enjoy the process? You see, with a better crafted question, you get a better answer. And so I started asking different questions. How can I get back to the same amount of money I had in a much shorter time and without working 12 hours a day? And then you start looking for the answer. Your brain searches the universe for the information and ultimately finds it. And I found real estate investing. And so there it was in front of me. New question, new answer, new result. These people out there that don't care about being financially free have asked a question early on in life. The question is, is it worth it, the work and the suffering to become rich? And then they look at their parents and they see their friends and they see these people are working their butt off and they're not rich. So if working your butt off doesn't equate to rich, how much harder do I have to work to become rich? The answer is I have to work double or triple the amount of time and effort to get there because normal people just working their butt off aren't getting there, right? So again, they have the wrong view of what it takes to become wealthy and hence they don't want it. So you think about it, they don't want it even. They don't want it because they can't conceive getting there without it killing them, right? Uh, the next one, it says here, they are unaware of the power of their subconscious mind. Uh, ever come across the sentence, rich people think like rich people and poor people think like poor people? Believe me, we all have self-concept. You have a self-concept of your weight, your business, your intelligence, your communication skills. Equally and critically, you have a self-concept of your current financial reality. It's quite fascinating, but most people who won the lottery very often lose all of it within a short period of time. So in other words, how do you see yourself? If you can't see yourself as a wealthy person, you're not going to be able to manifest the psychological powers necessary. Because if you go back to the book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he says, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. But you have to conceive it and believe it to be able to manifest it. So conceive comes first. I can conceive being wealthy. Believe I can. Believe in yourself that you have the power to do it. And then achieve or manifest it out of nothing. Because wealth does come out of nothing. Of course, if you inherit it, you've got to step up on the world. If you win the lottery, you've got to step up on the world. But the bottom line is most people that are rich never won the lottery nor inherited all their money. Most people are self-made millionaires who started with an idea, worked on that idea, conceived it, believed it, and then manifested it out of nothing, out of thin air. I own many different businesses. And I just created them. I just said, you know what? I want, I want to have a business. I want to have this kind of business. And I want to own real estate. And I want to own this kind of real estate. And so I just conceived it and then went out and manifested it. It's not difficult once you can conceive and believe that your mind has the power to do it. But you have to believe in your mind. Right? You have to believe in your ability to manifest. Today we're covering an article called Why People Retire Poor. And uh, we've come to question or to reason number four, which is they surround, they are surrounded and influenced by other poor people. Um, you've heard this many, many times, many places. I don't know the first place I ever heard it. But I feel like it's true that you will become whoever you surround yourself with. And um, it might work the other way around. It says, okay, I guess it's Ziegler said, they have it in here. It says, many people fail to realize the influence their reference group has on their destiny. Ziegler once said, you can't be flying with eagles if you're scratching with turkeys. So um, the, the bottom line is, is that if you hang out with poor people, You've got poor people thinking. We call it stinking thinking. Ziegler called it stinking thinking. 
And uh, the only way you can get rid of stinking thinking is to bury it. So if you can imagine this, you got a, a yard full of manure. You want to get rid of it. The only thing you do is bring in a truckload of fresh dirt. And that truckload of fresh dirt, my friends, is new friends. You've got to start hanging out with new people. One of the first things people are amazed at when they come to Lifestyles is the people that they meet up with and how open they are and willing to help each other. And it's a like-minded community. I've been I've worked very hard for 30 years to create a community of people that are all filled with one basic concept, which is the abundance theory. There's enough in this world for all of us, uh, as opposed to the zero-sum gain theory, which is for me to have a dollar, I've got to take it from you. And I think that is what most poor people believe, that the world is unfair because the rich people take all the money and the poor people don't have any left, as opposed to rich people's belief that rich people create money and they have leftover money to give to other people that don't know how to create money. So who do we give it to? We give it to employees. We give it to our customers uh, with you know customer discounts and benefits and so forth. Uh, we give it to the government to help run the country and or to be given back to other poor people. So you have to change that theory of how you see the world. That zero-sum gain isn't going to make for success in life. You have to. In fact, I have a theory. If you help enough other people in this world get what they need, you can have whatever it is in life you want. And people tell me all the time, Dell, that's just stupid. And I go, what do you mean that's stupid? Because well, I help somebody once and I'm not rich. I go, once? Once isn't enough. If I had one red house, I wouldn't be rich. Because that's only helping one family have a nice place to live. I have thousands and thousands of units over my lifetime of being in this business. So I've helped thousands and thousands of families to have a clean, functional place to live at a fair price. And how do you know that you have a clean, functional place to live at a fair price? Well, because you're full, because you have no problem maintaining and or receiving new tenants into your your apartments or your houses. And I've done both homes and apartments. And it's both the same thing. This isn't a place where people just stay. This is somebody's home. This is their residence. This is where they raise their children, where they have Christmas, Thanksgiving, and so forth. This is their home. And so when you deal with people for that level, you have to, in your mind, think, what is it that I would want in my home? And then you have to have the empathy to understand that they want it because that's their goal in life. And you're offering to solidify that goal in their life in return for you making money by helping other people. So if you want more money in your life, you're going to have to be able to help more people. Once is not enough. And if you hang around with people go that, well, I did something good once, then you're not going to get very far. The next one is number five. They never confront the brutal facts of their financial reality. Um, guys, this has always been a pet peeve of mine. People don't talk about their money. It's, it's, it's considered rude to talk about money. It's considered rude to ask your parents. Can you imagine asking your parents, how much money do you have, mom and dad? Where's it at? What are you doing with it? Now, people in lifestyles, we do that. We talk to people across the board, each other. We talk to our kids. We talk to other people's kids. We teach people where the money's at and how to invest it. And we talk about it. But if you can't talk about it, and I tell people this all the time, you know, Dell, please help me figure out how to become financially free. I go, okay, tell me what you got. Well, I can come up with no, 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 no. You know what happens when you talk about money? Rich people hide that they have money, and poor people brag that they have money they don't have. 
Everybody wants to lie about money because they're talking about their ego more than they're talking about facts. Well, if you don't understand the facts behind money, if you don't realize what you really have and where it's at, then you can't understand. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say I'm talking to the average person out here. So, uh, Bob and Julie, do you have a home? Yes, you do. Okay, how much is that home worth? Well, it's worth three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. Typical median price right now for a home in Houston is probably around three hundred thousand. So, I have a home that's three hundred thousand. Okay, so is it paid in full? Or no? Okay, well, how much do you owe on it? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, what is your mortgage payment? Well, they don't even know what their mortgage payment is. And of the mortgage payment, how much of it is principal? How much is interest? How much is taxes? How much is insurance? Uh, well, I can't really tell you that either. Okay, let me ask you this. You've got a home and you've got some equity. Let's let's guess. You got let's say you owe a hundred thousand on it, it's worth three hundred, so you have two hundred thousand in equity in your home. Answer this for me. How much money came in the mail last month or any month last year from your home? Did your home, that two hundred thousand dollars that is yours in that house, did it pay you any money? And they go, what do you mean, did it pay me any money? A house doesn't pay you money. I go, my houses pay me money. I go, well, that's ridiculous. No, they do. So what about if we took the 200000 out of the house and put a 3% interest mortgage on it? So we could go out there and earn you 10% on that $200,000. So that'd be twenty grand a year. But I'd have to pay a mortgage payment. You're already paying a mortgage payment. All we're doing is adding $200,000 at 3%, which would be $6,000 a year. So now you're making $20,000 a year on that money, and you're paying an additional $6,000 a year in interest. Wouldn't that be a smart thing to do? Now you're netting. That house that you're living in is now paying you $14,000 a year. Hmm. That's the facts. They don't want to confront the tax. Let's talk about your 401k and the facts, right? How much does your 401k pay you each month? Well, it's making money. It's invested. No, 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 no. Let's not lie to ourselves. It's not making you any money. You are paying it. Each and every month of your life, you're putting money into that thing. You're paying into it. Now, think about if I told you I wanted you to buy a rent house, and here was the theory behind the rent house. I want you to buy this rent house. I want you to go ahead and pay mortgage payments on it every month and not rent it. But the goal is, is that 30 years from now, the house will be paid off, and I'll have the value of the home plus whatever appreciation there is. That's the goal of your 401k. At the end of 30 years, you will have it filled up. It would be worth something, and maybe it will have appreciated But if I told you to do that with a house, you'd go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And it is. It's as dumb as having a 401k, which is just plain stupid. Because you're paying into it every month. Think about if you had that 500 to 1,000 bucks you're sticking in there every month in your hand, in your pocket, that you could go invest. Think of the money you could make. But to do that, you'd have to admit to the facts that almost everything you're doing with your money is wrong. In fact, I'd be willing to say everything you're doing with your money is wrong or what I call oxymoronic. In other words, what you should be doing with your money is exactly opposite of what you do with your money. Number six, most people don't save. I don't know if I even need to go into this one. (laughs) Either you do or you don't. We've talked about this earlier. You know, you live on less than what you make. Pay yourself first. That's the basic concept, right? Um, But the concept here is that you end up what we call killing the golden goose. In fact, it's such a good story, I think I'll tell it when we come back. We'll be right back with the Del Wamsley Radio Show. on designing a lifestyle. When I was younger, I decided that I was not going to live the life that the average person lived, which was to think I was going to work for the end of my life, save up enough money, and then when I'm old and gray like I am now, try to buy my life back with a pile of money that I had. I said, no, I'm going to design a life and I'm going to live that life. That's it, period. Are you ready to design your life? 
Learn how at Lifestyles Unlimited's live online free workshop. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Del Wamsley talks about buying your way back from corporate America through real estate. A massive change in my life. My personal residence I lived in was a one-bedroom condo, cost 425 bucks a month. This covered it. My automobile car payment was only 300 and some dollars a month. This covered it. I was buying my way back from corporate America. I could feel it. Lifestyles Unlimited will teach you how to buy your way back from corporate America. Get in control. Get into our live online free workshop. Register at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Today, we're talking about an article that says, Why do most people retire poor? And we're up to number seven, which says they are unaware of the power of compounding interest, of compound growth. And I wanted to tell a story before we went to break about this one. And I've modified the story. It was a fairy tale when you were a little kid. It's called The Goose That Laid the Golden Eggs, right? Um, But I want to tell you it in my version of it, okay? So it's kind of, I've modified the story. If you go, well, that's not the way I read the story when I was a kid. But the way that I see the story is there was a guy who had a goose. One day he walked out to the bar and he found the goose had laid a golden egg. And he didn't really know what it was, so he took it down to downtown and took it to a jeweler and Julie goes, yeah, it's a golden egg. And he goes, wow. He goes, you're rich. You know, that that's a lot of money. So the guy got the money, he sold the golden egg and he was so excited about having this easily acquired wealth of money that he went out and uh, went to the local bar and bought everybody drinks and dinner and spent all the money. No time at all. He's right back to being a poor farmer. So lo and behold, he was destitute and he kept looking for this goose to lay another golden egg. And um, the goose never did lay another golden egg um, because he neglected the goose, right? Because he was out there spending all his money and having a great time and considering himself rich, he didn't come home and farm. He didn't feed the goose. He didn't clean the goose. And the goose was laying around in a bunch of goose manure. And so the goose got sick and eventually the goose died. What did he do? He cut the goose open to try to see if there's any more golden eggs inside. And there wasn't any more golden eggs inside, right? So there's an alternative method or an alternative story here. And the alternative story is, is that along came a goose investor named Del Wamsley. And this investor in geese, and especially like golden egg geese came along and saw this guy was neglecting this goose and you know he was saying wow this stupid goose won't lay any more golden eggs i don't even care about it anymore and so this goose investor named el wamsley bought the goose from the farmer he took the goose home he cleaned the goose up got him a nice place to live sort of like rehabbing the goose as we would rehab a property he rehabbed the goose fed the goose took it to the doctor got it some medicine in fact gave it some steroids and got it much larger now the goose was big and strong and guess what it did it laid a golden egg now this goose investor, Del Wamsley, could have been a wholesale flipper guy and taken the egg and sold the egg or flipped the goose for money for a profit. But he didn't do that. He's an investor, not an outvestor. And so what he did was he got the golden egg. He went and took the golden egg and bought another goose and, you know, traded the golden egg for another goose and brought the two geese together and raised the geese together. And guess what happened? All of a sudden, there was all kinds of little baby geese and um Goslings, I think they're called. I'm, I'm guessing at that one, but I think that's the word. But there's all these baby geese, and he raised them and fed them and took care of them, and they all grew up. And then all of them would lay a golden egg. And he took all those golden eggs, and he bought more geese until one day he had hundreds of geese laying eggs for him. But then one day he got tired of being a goose guy and going out there and feeding and cleaning the goose bends and everything. And he wanted to grow faster. So what he did was he went and he sold his flock of geese. Instead, he bought cows. And he put the cows, because they were passive income, he put them out in the field and he didn't have to clean them. He didn't have to feed them. He didn't take care of them. The cows were like passive, giant apartment complexes, passive income. 
And when the cows had calves, they had big calves. So they reproduced massively along with producing milk. And so now we had a current stream of milk coming or a current stream of income coming passively. And when they could get pregnant, they had these giant capital gains calves. These gigantic capital gains calves were these just massive amounts of gain that came every time they would have a new calf. And that's exactly what happens. We have cash flow. We live off the cash flow. We maintain the apartment complexes. We have other people do that for us because that's not our job. It's not a job. It's an investment. We don't work in a business. We work on a business. But then every once in a while, man, that thing's gone up in value so much, you refinance out a giant a giant capital gains calf. And all that money comes out tax-free. One giant capital gains calf. Love that story. <laughs> took a little, uh, took a little love. Um, what do you say? There's a word for it where you make up your own story, and I did on that one. Number eight, they work for money as opposed to having money work for them. You get up and go to work every day because you're working for money. I get up every day, and my money is working for me. That's the difference between being passive, uh, being financially free, and having passive income as opposed to get up and go to work every day and having a job. They cannot conceive what passive income is. In fact, even when they go to buy real estate, they turn real estate into a job. They go to work every day, right? Um, they do their own rehab, their own maintenance, their own repairs. They, um, they do all their own leasing, and it becomes a job. So even real estate can be turned into a job, and that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to create passive streams of income. Number nine reason they retire poor is lack of knowledge, skills, and coaching to become financially free. My friends, it's time to get into lifestyles. You need, right now, knowledge, skills, and a coach. That's how you will overcome retiring poor. And last, they have no plan. And we have a plan. We have a plan that has worked for 30 years with thousands, tens and tens of thousands of people, over 50,000 clients right now. So my friends, get into lifestyles now. Start changing your life so that you won't be one of the 95% of Americans who retire poor and or broke. Hope you enjoyed the show. Look forward to working with you again tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. And remember, it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.